All right, so for my uh, master's thesis, I wrote about comics, and uh, I picked a few things that happen in comics that you wouldn't really expect to happen in comics. So I picked, uh, so comics, first of all, are a static and a purely visual medium. Uh, so I picked motion, time, sound, this thing called pictorial realness to uh, go into. So um, I, I analyzed these like kind of like invisible elements. Like they're not really invisible because you can see them, but uh, or some of them you can see, like you can see motion. But to something like comics, they're invisible. So comics doesn't have uh, motion isn't inherent. So it shouldn't be able to portray uh, this. It shouldn't be able to portray time and sound because. No time is actually passing, and no sound is actually happening, uh, except, you know, the passing of your own time, and maybe the sound that the pages make as you're flipping through them. And I relate them to uh, cognition and perception. Um, and so, uh, in the section uh, called motion, I describe how images like this um, kind of, I guess, trick uh, like visual perception, like the V5 area, um, visual motion areas of the brain. Um, how we have mental representations of movement, um, and a few constraints also. Uh, in the section called Time, I talk about how, um, how space, how panel length can affect our temporal judgments of the images inside of comics, how content affects this uh, also. Um, and in Sound, I talk about how we fill in and make more concrete uh, the sound effects that comic, uh, comic artists illustrate um, and such. And then in the section called Pictorial Rooms, I describe these weird little symbols that comic illustrators use. Um, and they kind of, uh, they take them off of one visual domain. So, so for instance, you might see if a truck drives through the mud, you can see lines from the tire tracks. Or if a boat goes through um, a uh, a lake. You can see the the weight behind it and everything like that. Um, and these uh, these lines are taken out of those situations and put in situations where they don't belong. So, like when someone were to sw swipe their hand through the air, you wouldn't see a line behind it. Um, but comic artists commonly do this, and I'll kind of describe like why and how those work and stuff like that. Um, so first, we'll start with motion. Um, now, in comics, there is no motion actually is happening in comics, so all the stuff right here is really a lie. The only thing that actually really does happen is when you turn the page. So that's the only motion that you really get from comics, except that some really cool things are happening. Um, if we were to just take that little dot right there, and just uh, or any shape, and if we preserve its identity um, when we repeat uh, an instance of the shape, when we show the shape again, um, and uh, kind of have it move down the line. We imagine this dot as a dot moving through space rather than many dots. Um, possibly, hopefully. But hopefully when you see images like this, you're seeing uh, one girl running and not, uh, what, nine girls running and one giant girl. Um, hopefully what's happening here is their, uh, the, the illustrator is basically repeating uh, the image right here is the first instance of her, so it's almost almost identical, so that your mind recognizes oh, this is the same person, and can see that she's running from something, or that's also her, and, and she's running, and not just some identical figure uh, through space. Um, additionally, uh, and I'm going to go through this really fast, so there aren't really like transitions or anything like that. I'm just kind of going like. This thing and this thing and this thing. Yeah. Um, so shapes also have uh, can also express uh, motion and movement through their dynamicity. Um, so it's shapes like arrows and lightning bolts and that kind of thing. But also shapes that are um, off kilter or things that are rolling down hills. Like so, we imagine that this rectangular form is about to fall. Um, we imagine that um, that ball is going to roll down. Uh, the slanted objects. Um, objects can stand in the way of other objects. So the little thing that's the uh, octagon at the end of that tri uh, the triangle is preventing the triangle from going any further. So in in shape itself, uh, there's information that uh, relays motion information to our to our brains. So um, 
Rudolf Einheim, Arnheim and uh, Michael Layton um, describe uh, dynamicity and of, of forms and um, uh, maximal asymmetric forms. So when the blacksmith right here uh, is at his full position where his hammer is fully outraised, uh, upraised, we understand the uh, severity of the hit from that that uh, single frame more than any others. So even when he's when he's like this, even though it's the motion that leads to the final motion, uh, it's this motion up here, the full spring, that we get this uh, this final hitting of the uh, of the anvil. Um, when horses are shown in this complete leap, where their uh, hooves are furthest out from their resting position, um, we um, we, th this, this conveys the most uh, motion information, the most uh, movement. Um, it's, it's, fur it's, it's the animal's furthest position from rest. Um, even when artists learned through photography that uh, horses will at least have one hoof on the ground, they still continue to portray uh, horses in this fully outstretched position. Um, because it gives this, you know, this sense of it's it's going forward, it's moving, it can't be stopped. Um, and so we can see this in comics from this uh, from Jean Garrod's Blueberry. Um, Blueberry is uh, going as fast as he can with this horse, um, but if you notice the horse in this uh, scene, his feet aren't even touching the ground. The, the front horse, um, he's almost like flying through space. Uh, if you if you look at the the shape that the horse makes from it, the tip of its front hoof to the to his cowboy hat to the back of the other horse, it's the shape of a triangle um, moving through the path in front of it. There's not even a, a single cactus uh, in his way. All the cactuses w which could possibly stand in his way are out out, uh, out of his out out of his way. Um, uh, it's it also contrasts with the cactuses which are still forms that are. Um, yeah, that are just still forms. Um, we can just kind of moving on. We can see uh, shapes like this and think about it for a second. Um, but then we have shapes like this, which you know, this is a circle. And uh, to Michael Layton, he would say that this is the uh, the most symmetrical form we have, the form that all other forms come from. Um, so when we see this shape, we imagined it as a circle that's been compressed. And when we see this shape, we imagine that same compressed circle that's either been pulled out or pushed from the inside. Um, and to him, any dent, scratch, or scrape has a history. So when we see the scratch on this man's face, we rewind this, this moment and we think about what could have caused that? So it was someone scratching his face. Um, there's experimental evidence for this with uh, Chen and Scholl did an experiment where they presented people a square and then a intermediate step and the final form, this intruded form, uh, where it looks like something pressed into it. They also presented uh, other people with a just the square and the final intruded form. And the people that uh, saw the intruded condition, as opposed to the <clears throat> imposed condition, um, were more likely to imagine this intermediate step in the actual sudden change condition. So their mind is kind of like tricking them into thinking that, they, that, it, that it happened gradually rather than all of a sudden, um, adding motion where there's none. Uh, we can see image, images in comics like this one where Anima's skin uh, is instantly getting boils, and they're coming out of her skin. You can see like um, the the pus that's coming out that is is so is so dynamic that it almost seems to move. Um, uh, a lady by the name of Jennifer Frey did, did a set of experiments where she presented people with uh, rotated parallelograms. Um, she would present first this one then this one, and then the, finally this one. And then um, 
she would have people try to, uh, so then she would show a fourth parallelogram, and it would either be in the same or a different position. And if it was in the same position, of course, they would answer the same. But if it was in a different position, they would answer either the same or different. Um, and if, if the, if the uh, parallelogram continued that rotation, um, they were more likely to say that that was the same as the previous parallelogram. Um, we're mentally representing the movement. So when we see a series of movements, we're, we're mentally representing what's going to happen next. Um, she also did the same with pictures of people jumping. So this is one where someone's jumping off a ledge. And people, again, were likely to, if they saw um, uh, yeah, an image of a, of a person jumping, and then they saw another one where the person's further down the line, they were more likely to misremember the one further down the line as having been the previous picture. Um, so when we see images like this from Akira, uh, we mentally represent the tra trajectory of Akira's kick where uh, Takashi is being kicked into and, uh, and the, the water. And not, so it's not just the, the people, uh, but it's also the objects in there. So we also mentally represent how the water acts. Um, she also did the study where she had uh, forms hold up other forms. So um, we have one instance where there's a stand and one where there's a hook. So in the stand condition, she would show a plant resting on a stand. And th these are like the actual stimuli, so they're drawn stimuli, they weren't uh, pictures or anything. And then she would show uh, the, stim the, the stand removed or the hook removed. And people would mentally represent the plant as having fallen a little bit further down um, in their in the remember condition, um, which is pretty cool. And same with uh, the spring. If if a, if a box was added to the spring, they'd imagine the spring as being more compressed. If a box was removed, they'd imagine the spring as being less compressed. And there there these happened in similar as to how these uh, experiments were presented. Um, so when we see images like this. Um, we're not only representing the things that we'd expect to move, like the cannon or the treadmill or anything that spins or the slide that comes down, but also the table that holds up the cat. <clears throat> if, the t if, if we were sh shown the table uh, holding up the cat and then shown another comic image where the table was removed, we'd imagine the cat as, you know, there's nothing supporting it, so we imagine that it would be ready to fall. <clears throat> And when we see images like this, where Dr. Manhattan is uh, letting the sand fall through his fingers, we are mentally representing gravity in the scene. And when we see the sand continue to fall, but him rise up, we create new rules that uh, tell us that while sand follows the rules of gravity, he follows a different set of rules. Um, this picture is unsupported by its hand, so it's falling. Um, it's also at, uh, or the photograph is unsupported by hand, its hand, so it's falling. Um, it's at an oblique angle. It's an oblique orientation, so it's a dynamical form. Um, whereas if the, if the picture were upright, where all of its angles were parallel to the, the frame of the, of the comic, um, we wouldn't get the same sense as falling. We'd get more of a sense like it's uh, being levitated in space. Um, the picture also, the, the photograph also has uh, creases and dents and folds in the, uh, in itself, uh, rips that let us know that there, uh, that, that things happened to this, that, that events had acted on this photograph, and our mind will mentally represent uh, these events. Additionally, when we see images like these, where uh, we have this uh, Ozymandias um, catching a bullet or getting shot by a bullet. Um, he, uh, we we uh, represent these in our V5 visual motion area. Um, there have been study, fMRI studies where uh, they presented um, people with pictures of either athletes in motion or uh, animals in motion or objects in motion. And these uh, photographs activated the V5 visual motion areas more than uh, pictures of, let's say, houses or something like that, or things that were just still, um, which didn't uh, activate it. Um, the same goes for 
action words. So when we see, uh, when we read uh, words like attack uh, or jump or anything like that, um, we're representing these, or we're, I guess, experiencing these in, in our, the visual motion areas of our brain. The perceptual motion areas, or at least near, nearby areas. Um, nature, uh, when we see animals coiled up or ready to spring, um, we, this animal is giving us the sense that it's going to attack. It doesn't necessarily mean that it will. It's kind of like warning you, you know, uh, through its spring of what the final action is going to be. Um, and this happens in nature. It also happens in comic books where uh, this uh, debtor um, shakes his fist. He doesn't actually, he doesn't intend to hit immediately, um, but it's a threat. And it has motion information in it. Um, this is also common in, uh, in art where the artist wants to get as much information in one scene as possible. So they're showing, uh, uh, they're showing scenes where that, that aren't possible in real life um, just to give an effect of uh, there's a lot happening. And so uh, Karl Vox is a, an illustrator. Um, he began his career as an in-betweener in Disney uh, animations and did a lot of Donald Duck comics. Um, this is the late and great Sven Ostergaard and Frederick Sternfeld. And they uh, collaborated uh, on analyzing uh, Karl Barks's uh, Donald Duck comics. And they found some pretty cool uh, things that happened. So they found that um, <coughs> when you present a scene that's predictable, they'll, you'll, you, you'll get the uh, beginning of the action, and the end of the action, the result, um, but the middle, the the uh, the middle information, the stuff that happens in between, <coughs> is presented in the form of movement lines, um, and it can be left out. Um, and here we have uh, a young Art Spiegelman, and his dad tosses the comic book out of his out of his hands, where we have the final result. <coughs> This is also uh, an another rule that they found is if the event is unpredicted, unpredictable, they won't show the beginning of the event. Um, they'll show the, the middle part and they'll show the final result. Um, they might also show um, characters that witness the event happening too. Um, this is another instance of that. Uh, where they won't show the beginning, but they'll show the final result, and the camera's kind of like the witness of this. Um, when a character finds something, they don't have, you don't have to show the character leaving the room and re-entering their room. Well, that's just kind of understood that, that uh, uh, our mind just fills in the blanks. Um, they're likely to uh, illustrate scenes where there's a turning point. So when something crashes, when something breaks, um, when anything uh, significant happens, and a lot of times these will, uh, these turning points will have a, um, a sound effect that goes along with it, and sometimes they'll even have a result or a result with with, with its own sound effect as well. Um, and then uh, finally, uh, each scene, each panel will only convey one new piece of information. So even if it seems like there's a lot of information going on in a panel, um, so for instance, we have all the people running up the, the pyramid, there's a mutant right here at the front, there's John DeFool right here who is flying, and this is the only new piece of information right here, that he's now flying and he's in the lead. Uh, and everything else we, we can see from uh, the previous, uh, in the previous panels. Um, and this is another thing where it seems like a lot's going on in this panel, um, but the only new piece of information is Scrooge McDuck enters. And, uh, okay. And now I'm going to move on to time. Uh, so time is a pretty weird topic in general. And in comics, uh, 
people like Scott McCloud. So Scott McCloud wrote this book called Understanding Comics, and it's pretty cool. I, I highly recommend uh, checking it out. Um, but he notes that time is, is infinitely weirder than what you imagine it can be in comics. Um, so one of the things that he's a big uh, supporter of or a believer in is that um, in here in the panels uh, are temporal information. So um, in a sense, the uh, well, I guess I'll say it in a second. But so you can have a, a, a scene where you have this guy uh, presenting something, this guy pausing, and then answering. Um, you can extend that time by increasing the an, amount, the number of panels. Um, you can also extend the time by increasing the size of the panel. And Scott McCloud also says that you can uh, increase the time by present, uh, by increasing the size of the gutter in between the panels. Um, and the idea is that um, time can be understood in spatial terms. Um, so time is space in a sense. Um, which is pretty common in language. We can have things like a long time ago, you know, length, uh, describing time. Um, now, there, uh, Casasanto and Borodisky wanted to do a study um, where they found non-linguistic evidence for this. So they presented people with these growing lines. Uh, they presented people with, um, yeah, growing lines of different shapes or different sizes. And uh, irrespective of like how uh, wait, let's see how am I saying this? So when people saw longer lines, they judged them uh, as having been on the screen longer. So lines that uh, grew uh, longer, uh, people would say that they were on the screen for longer durations. Even though it was not the case. Even though that was not the case. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and... Um, there are similar things found in magnitude judgments. Um, so in this case, um, a fellow by the name of Zwan with a Z, oh, with an X, uh, found that uh, people judge things of higher magnitudes to be on the screen longer than things of lower magnitudes, even when they've been on the screen for the same amount of time. So people would judge like the nine to be on the screen uh, more than the one, if it was all, if both of them were on the same the screen for the same amount of time, uh, and this happened also with uh, the dice looking numbers, the size of these squares. Um, they also uh, luminosity was a thing, so luminosity, I guess, uh, you related to magnitude as well, and uh, and the, the the amount of the digit. Um, so when we see images like this in comics where uh, the kid asked the shopkeeper how he lost his hand. Yeah, how he lost his hand. And the shopkeeper reminisces about it. We can imagine this scene is happening in the shopkeeper's mind for a long amount of time. Um, he's, it's, it's either he's thinking and like he's pausing and this kid is just sitting there waiting for an answer, or, or it's, it's, it's in, just in his mind that it feels like it keeps going and going. Um, but you can see that Six frames fit into this one giant frame, at least from top to bottom, and maybe more if you wanted to jam them all in there. Um, now, a fellow called Neil Kahn disagrees with uh, Scott McCloud. He says that um, it's not the size of the panel, but it's actually the content itself that uh, tells us the temporal information. So he says scenes like this, where um, it looks like an establishing shot um, where there's no, it doesn't seem like any time is actually passing. Um, they're timeless, shouldn't convey temporal information. We should just read this as if it um, was just like, you know, the establishing shot of a movie where it says this is a house, you know, this is a, this is a lake or something like that. Um, then he also has another type of uh, scene that he calls the polymorphic panel, um, which is a scene that has a circular event. So you might have, I think this obelix, right? Yeah. Yeah, this obelix. Uh, what a question. What? What a question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, you have obelix slapping. Um, and uh, you can read it as either it's just one slap, but you, then you can also look at it as a circular action, which continuously happens. So if you notice at the top, you have the, 
the sound uh, presented five times. So you could see it as him slapping five times back and forth and be stuck on that panel for five slaps. And the dog barks at least three times. So you have, you have other information inside of uh, panels just uh, besides the, the, the length, the size of the panel itself. Um, now, uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Will Eisner um, agrees that content is important when we're talking about time in, in comics, but he also notes that panels are more like rhythmic devices. So the size of a panel is like a music note. Um, you have single beats, and uh, then the beats can be extended, and then they can be uh, compressed and happen faster. Um, I guess like quarters and stuff like that. Uh, and uh, but he, he still notes that you know this this has to do with the rhythm and our understanding of the actual time that passes in the comic happens from the, the content itself. Um, so we can take scenes like this where uh, from Persepolis Lee's where she's she can't even make it through the center point of the panel. It's like she's dragging on. Um, her feet are stuck to the ground. Um, kind of like talking about the dyna dy dynamics of, this, of the, the object. Um, it's as if she's not even moving because she can't. She's so like overwhelmed and just goes forever until like a quick moment when she hears her name called and it happens like a flash. And then it feels like a little bit longer time uh, than, the, than the flash moment. Uh, where she's reunited with her mother, and then, but the moments after that happen much faster and more of a rhythm uh, than, than the other uh, other panels. Um, this can also happen when there's no change in the size of the panel. So a fellow by the name of Theory Groston, Groston um, talks about this thing called the waffle iron grid, the waffle iron layout, where each panel has it's the same time scale, and it doesn't take away from the, the content or the scene itself. So this one is, is uh, done so perfectly that even the lights in it um, flicker for each beat. So it goes on, and then off, and then on, and then off, and then on, and off, etc. And just to give you a sense that the timing is just on perfect. Um, and these waffle iron layouts, can in a way compress and extend time. So here uh, we have uh, Bruce Wayne. Yeah, Bruce Wayne uh, imagining or, or remembering the moment when his parents uh, were murdered. And it takes one flash moment and it extends it over 16 panels. And the, the converse can be true too. You can have four panels that go from the beginning of time to dinosaurs to now to the end of time. Um, but all in all, uh, comic illustrators can do some pretty crazy things with time. Uh, I'm not going to go too deep into this. I'm just going to say that in this, it goes from the present to the future, to the present, to the far past, to the present, to the future, but not as far future as the other one, and then to a scene which you can think of as timeless. And all at the same time, when he's thinking about moments in other times, so it could be he could be in, uh, thinking in both the future and the present at the same time through the the um, the image in the panel and the text in the dialogue. And now we're going to go into sound. So sound is, in, in uh, purely visual media, is, is a pretty interesting thing. So if you take a look at the far, uh, the far image where the guy has the hammer, um, I found this whole thing on uh, uh, Reddit. They're no called noisy GIFs. And uh, they're basically images where you, th you kind of hear a sound, but you don't know why. Um, and uh, like this one, um, you can't help but hear like this really deep like thud. This like every time that that, that shakes. Um, and uh, there's evidence in, and I'll get into this a little bit, but not too much. Um, there's evidence in cross-moral correspondences that talks 
uh, a little bit about why this is. Um, but I think certainly there's a lot more that can be said. Um, all right. So this is a scene uh, from Scott McCloud's uh, Understanding Comics. And he says, and I agree with him, that we're hearing this pot boil. We're hearing this uh, cucumber, zucchini, uh, squash being cut. Um, and we're hearing the egg timer tick away. And even in the, the third panel, we're still hearing those things happening. We're still hearing all those events. Um, our mind is, um, yeah, our mind is uh, filling in uh, details presented and making more concrete the details that we aren't getting. Um, and uh, I have to say one more time that it's a monosensory uh, medium that only conveys one sense. That's vision, um, and just to give you an idea of how how we fill in and make concrete uh, details, um, I want you guys to read this little uh, excerpt from Harry Potter. Filling in details like we might, um, when we're reading, repressing a large belch, we might um, get an idea of how he's doing that or the way he's doing it, if, he, if it makes a sound or not. Um, when uh, he's refilling the, the mugs, we might fill in the details of what the mugs look like um, or, or how he refills them, you know, if it's slowly or fast. Um, and we're all doing this in our own minds. You know, this isn't in, this isn't. Um, well, it's not uh, specifically uh, told to us. But then we're also making more concrete these de uh, this scene. So we might imagine the chair that Slughorn uh, is sitting in, if he's sitting in a chair, if we imagine that. We might imagine the table that the mugs are on, even though um, J.K. Rowling never put any information in this, in this little excerpt about uh, those things. So we're, we're filling in certain things and we're making more concrete other, other things. And I say that we're also doing this in comics. Um, so I say that um, <clears throat> we're filling in the sound uh, of, of this pot boiling, and the sound of this chops, and the sound of the egg timer ticking away. And we're making these details, um, or this, this kitchen scene more concrete. Um, we might even add maybe a few things that we think are important to the, the story world as a uh, itself. Um, but whatever details we fill in or, or use to make this seem more concrete, um, they're details that uh, we would um, attune to as we're perceiving things in the world. So it's not just like we're filling in the scene completely. We're not filling in every detail of this kitchen. Um, but we're filling in things that we think are important to the, um, the actions that go on. Um, and this, is, this happens because we have experience with um, pots of soup boiling, or, or chopping uh, vegetables on a cutting board, egg timers. Um, and uh, I'm not going to go too much into perceptual systems, um, but uh, it's, it's when, when we have, uh, when we experience something, um, our mind kind of makes a, or our mind makes a memory of it, but not just uh, in some unit that stores things in our brain, but in the um, ways we experience this. So if it's something that we saw, our mind leaves like a, uh, an imprint uh, in, are in areas of our brain uh, next to where we uh, visually saw this or where we heard it. Um, and so even in the absence of one stimuli, like in the absence of sound, um, we can still, uh, um, these, these, uh, the way we experienced it is still, um, it still comes to our, to our mind. Um, yeah. 
So when you say that we <laughs> infer the sound that we know is happening, yeah. then that must also mean that we um, infer the motion that's happening? <coughs> yeah. Yeah, because if I just see a picture of a person chopping a board, if I hear the sound of it, then I also infer the person doing it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I think so at least. Um, so when we see scenes like this in Tintin, um, we can read, the, read these, uh, these uh, panels and we can imagine the machine gun, the sound the machine gun makes as it fires against the wall, or we can imagine the, uh, the car speeding off, the luggage falling down the stairs, or the clink of the, of the swords. And we're doing this because we have experience with these things, and um, it's, it's almost like a, some sort of myself. Another way that we can recognize sound uh, in comics, I, I propose, is through uh, cross-modal correspondences. Um, so uh, cross-modal correspondences are kind of like a synesthesia type uh, event where we pair um, two modes like vision which, with hearing um, that, that, that wouldn't normally be there. So. Um, in, in these experiments, they found um, certain things like more rounded shapes uh, to be paired with uh, lower pitch sounds and more uh, jaggedy shapes to be paired with uh, higher pitch sounds. Um, and then larger objects, lower pitch, smaller objects, higher pitch. Uh, words like uh, booba to be um, paired with uh, rounded forms and kiki to be paired with jagged forms because booba has more of a low pitched sound to it and kiki, you know, you stretch your lips out to the sides and has more of a, a higher pitched sound. Um, and of course, comic illustrators uh, illustrate all kinds of sounds in different ways. And while they don't intend for these to be in the same way that the, uh, like there's, there's experiment, experimental evidence for, um, they intend like these large sounds to be loud. Um, we can also uh, inadvertently uh, see big sounds like this as really deep booms um, for two reasons. One, because it's big, and also because of the deep sound that O's make. Um, so I, I say that when we're reading things like this bond, um, because it's a bigger word, we're um, interpreting it as um, a deeper sound. And because it has uh, little ripples in it, we're giving this deeper sound uh, these, I don't know, like not reverb, but uh, these slightly higher pitched qualities. But it's not so uh, jaggedy, it's just a little bit ripply. Whereas we're taking the little sounds, the zings, the clings, uh, and giving them uh, higher pitched sounds. And not just because of the way that they're written, you know, uh, making a higher pitch sound, but also because of the size of the, uh, the word itself. Um, and I say that also when uh, we see uh, word bubbles that are really rounded, um, like this one right here where the parrot's going, on oh, my beauty, he's saying in a really deep, sensual way. Whereas what Captain Haddock is hearing is this uh, high-pitched uh, eek because it's a very jaggedy form. Um, and this can also happen with the symbols that aren't uh, representative in word form. So the poof balls uh, as he goes through the car and the stars. So I say the poof balls have a more of a low pitch sound and the stars uh, represent high pitch sounds or give, give us a feel of high pitch sound. Um, uh, cross modal correspondences can also happen. So uh, it, they, these can, can happen statistically. So we can see like smaller objects continuously making uh, higher pitched sounds and larger objects making lower pitched sounds. But they can also happen semantically through the knowledge that we know of through culture and stuff like that. So um, here we know that Snowy or Terry or Malou uh, is making a high pitched woof, or, well, uh, and the line is making a low pitched one, not just because of anything the way it's written, but just because uh, Milu is small, and the lion is uh, really big. Um, there's 
uh, some pretty cool evidence in uh, subvocal articulation that shows that when we're reading, so when we're silently reading very difficult texts, that we're representing character voices. And they get this from, um, they presented people with these difficult texts where um, one text they were told was written by a slow speaker, and another text they were told was authored by a fast speaker. And people read the slow text, of the text they thought was written by the slow speaker as slower than the text written by the fast speaker. And um, because comics are a pairing of words and image, um, it has the same effect as a difficult text because you're going back and forth between the image and uh, the word, and you're slowing yourself down. Um, and this further causes you, if you're not doing it on purpose, uh, causes you to represent character voices, the different characters through the, uh, throughout comics. So you're, you're hearing them. Um, just through, uh, I say, through subvocal articulations. Um, so when we hear her singing, um, we're representing a different voice for her than when we hear this other person behind the door go, in you go, or the parents say, I can hear you. Um, or even when she's not singing. And finally, for sound, um, we might represent these notes up here. Uh, these piano notes differently for how the piano is playing, the schematic way we imagine the piano is playing, differently when we're reading the top, when we know it's a piano, than when we are revealed that it's actually a radio um, and not a piano. We, through, through our experience with radios, we know they sound different, so um, we uh, give it different sound, sound qualities in our natural representations. Okay. So now I'm going on, on to this thing called pictorial ruins. And uh, pictorial ruins are this uh, subset of symbols that kind of get their, their meaning from other forms. So um, when you're playing a guitar, obviously lines aren't emanating from it, um, or uh, lines aren't coming out of, uh, let's see if I can, yeah, here's, here we go. Um, so, when Scott McCloud has this pipe, there's actually smoke coming out of a real pipe. So these lines represent something that's real and visible that we can see. Um, but the same or similar lines uh, are also used to represent uh, smells. And those are invisible. Um, but to visually present uh, the sense of smell uh, to us, we've borrowed the one, the smoke lines, and used them onto I just realized that when I was young and I was reading comics and I, would, I was seeing these lines in front of like smelly things, yeah. I was actually thinking that whenever I would see something that is dirty, I would see lines like that in reality. And like I just realized that I had this idea in my mind that kind of faded away yeah. since I was not seeing them in the reality. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> it's just. It, it's kind of cool. I'm like, and, and I, I think even. Even when we're talking about like some things like smells and stuff, we'll still say it's it's dank so bad you can see it, you know. Even when you know we, you can't, we, yeah. but it's it's kind of like from this, you know, yeah. where we're taking that uh, from that and you know putting something that we saw in cartoons or comics and putting it in the real in real life and everything. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Um, So a fellow by the name of John Kennedy, but not related to the president John Kennedy, um, went to Papua New Guinea, to the Song people of Papua New Guinea, and uh, he presented them with uh, line drawings. And uh, they were really good at uh, recognizing line drawings of houses and boats and static things, but whenever he presented them line drawings of things that re represented movement, like these lines that represent, represent the flow of a river, or the lines that represent the, the movement of fire, um, uh, they had trouble uh, recognizing those. Um, so they would say, like the, the people, the song people would say that um, they thought that each individual line was a fish or something like that, or they'd give a reference to it. So they wouldn't see it as uh, motion. Uh, 
the river moving down the stream or the fire, you know, with its arms waving and everything. Yeah. You might get to the but then why why do you think that we understand? Probably it's because, because, it because we've seen it because all we've the seen time. It. Okay. Yeah, because because we've grown up with things like comics and yeah. and other things like uh, advertisements, which you know use these. And um, I I think there's a, a separate experiment where they even showed kids um, similar things. Um, I, I think they actually showed kids comics yeah. and they asked them what were the lines and okay. and at, at a certain age they could tell. But so it's just through just, us being exposed to it. it yes, okay. exactly. Um, in a separate experiment, he asked blind people to draw wheels with motion, and what they would do is they would either draw the spokes of these bicycle wheels as being curved, or they would draw, like for the far side one, uh, the, the many spokes, and um, the blind people would say, I know that the spokes don't actually curve, but I thought that was the best way to say that it was moving. You know? and. Uh, <laughs> And there's and the reason why so pictorial ruins are basically like this sort of visual metaphor, um, and um, they don't have a linguistic counterpart because like for instance there's no uh, saying for the wheel that has its uh, spokes bent as movement or something like that, um, and the idea is it's, it's borrowing uh, from other forms from other things uh, to create a different sense, a different uh, idea of motion or time or sound. Um, and so these, uh, these pictorial rooms will um, borrow from our sensory experiences of, uh, of life and, and everything, our sensory experience of movement, of, of smell, of sound, and it uh, kind of creates like it it's, uh, is very image schematic in, in uh, the perceptual uh, sense, um, not just vi the visual sense. Um, so when we have uh, these ribbon paths, we they represent paths where the impact flash represents an instant uh, of, of something happening, of the ball being hit. Um, these can also represent cause and effect. So we know the order of this scene um, based on these, uh, these pictorial ruins, um, the ribbon path, the impact flash and the ribbon path, um, and also through the way that we read uh, as far as like Western comics and everything um, from left to right. Uh, so, um, so yeah, here we know it began here with an instance where it landed uh, and then did it again, and then finally we have uh, the necrodoid coming out at the end. Um, so we, we get uh, temporal information from this um, from the set of symbols. And like I've been saying, uh, these symbols are borrowed from from other forms. So you know the anger might be borrowed from uh, a pot of boiling water, or uh, um, you know, is he steaming? He's about to explode. He's so red, and he's just heat, and you know, uh, there's all this pressure in his head. Uh, whereas some of these are borrowed from, uh, like I said, trucks going through mud or boats going through um, water with the weight behind them and everything. Um, Charles Forceville uh, did an analysis of Tintin comics where he uh, wrote down all the different runes that he found, and he categorized them, and the main categories he came with uh, were speed lines, uh, movement lines, droplets, spikes, spirals, and twirls, and each one has kind of a different effect. Um, some of them, <clears throat> so for instance, Tintin down here with the sweat beads, um, he might actually be sweating in this situation, but these sweat beads themselves are pictorial rune um, because sweat doesn't pop out like that, and more than likely, um, these beads, these beads uh, are, are a, an expression of the way he feels on the inside, something that he's not showing these guys um, with his facial expressions, but how he's uh, feeling. And, and we have some sort of uh, shared experience that we can feel that too. Um, 
And some of these have du dual meaning. So um, the, was it twirl? Yeah, the twirl right here is, well, I'll start over here. The twirl right here is a motion of the foot, but the twirl right here is a motion in the head saying that he's dizzy. You know, maybe he's drinking too much or something. <laughs> Vertigo. 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 Oh, okay. So he's sick. Okay. Yeah. So he's feeling like nauseous or something. I like how it just look at you. <laughs> okay. So we can also understand pictorial runes through uh, Gestalt principles. Um, so, for instance, uh, principle of similarity. Um, we know these droplets belong to the same room because they're similar to each other. So even though these droplets are on the opposite side of Tintin's head, we know they're part of the same emotion, likely the same with the, this little turtles right here. Um, and these ones are all similar to each other, so we know that they all belong to the sound of this drum. Um, we have proximity. Both the, uh, the tail of the, the, the word balloon and the word balloon itself is closest to the the white-haired professor's head. Um, so we know these words belong to him. Um, whereas the little odd sibyls are around the other, other professor's head. Um, so we know that uh, this is something that he's experiencing. And this isn't just, uh, we know that this isn't just, aren't just some weird drawings on the back of the wall. Because of their, it's, it would be too much of a coincidence <clears throat> for them to, um, be outlaid in that, uh, in that way. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> also through the principle of good, good continuation. Um, so here we're more likely to imagine this line uh, as A to D. This squiggly line is one line. And this other line is B to C, intersecting it, crossing through it. Um, and we're more likely to, to see it as this, rather than two, let's say, land masses that are, uh, inter that are crashing into each other. They're sliding along each other from A to B and from D to C um, through uh, the principle of good continuation. And the same goes with the, the S that we see there um, as one form of many many dots. Um, so when we see images like this, even if this image right here were presented completely black and white, so where the black forms would be all the laser beams and the spaceships and the ribbon paths behind them, uh, and the white form would be the, the, just the background, um, we would still be able to, if we were told that this is a spaceship uh, in this black and white form, um, we'd still be able to know that, okay, so if this is a spaceship, then this is the path that went behind it through uh, good continuation. And we wouldn't, for instance, say that, okay, well, the path of the spaceship actually came from here and then went this way all of a sudden because um, we're more likely to imagine uh, a fluid motion than uh, an abrupt uh, change. Okay. And so this is almost the end. And um, we can use this framework to analyze individual, any individual uh, panel in a comic. So we can see here that uh, uh, Casey Jones misses uh, this turtle. Can't tell who it is actually, but uh, because of the way the um, the ribbon path um, doesn't have an impact flash, so we can see that he moved out of the way first before his club hit him. Um, in the further panel, uh, the furthest panel, we can see the, um, the one vehicle has two uh, motion lines, two ribbon paths behind it that um, follow a, uh, well, one, they're similar to each other, so they follow the principle of similarity. Um, they're also uh, parallel to each other and Um, but uh, but then, they, then they also follow between the, the two vehicles, 
they follow a uh, common fate. So we know, without having seen it, that the cop car will end up in the same position as the van at some point, and possibly with the same uh, um, uh, pictorial ruins behind it, the same uh, ribbon, uh, ribbon path behind it. Um, we can get information about sound from the droplets, about time from you know, the size of the panels, or even how we feel. So um, when we see him holding his breath, we're more likely, besides the spatial information, more likely to see things like this as being longer times. We have information about movement through uh, the motion lines here, whereas these lines, these lines might be visible in real life, but we probably wouldn't see these lines outside of him moving like that, giving you a sense of motion. And then we have this one, uh, where every scene is an action scene. Um, we have temporal information. We have the steady beat at the beginning, uh, a, a little bit of an extension, followed by another extension, followed by a really fast beat. We have um, dynamic characters, characters in motion. We have sound effects. So when we hear uh, that shot, the uh, jagged lines will give us a sense of uh, high-pitched sound as the wood got chopped in half. Um, we have, I think, over 12 pictorial ruins, some of which are like two lines to, to form one single one. Um, a pretty cool effect that I just want to point out. The ribbon paths even say twiz at the end of them. <laughs> and, and yeah, uh, illustrators can do lots of really cool things with these. Um, and this is pretty much the, uh, the end of my uh, presentation. Um, like, but I'm just going to point out one, one really quick thing that I think is pretty cool. So this one right here uh, is not just an impact flash that depicts a moment, but it's also the aftermath of the impact flash. So it's the tent ripping, too. Um, so, and so it's just a little thing. But, uh, but yeah, so and that is that. <laughs> So in, in visual media, like you're doing a lot less filling in um, just with the visual part because um, you're you're pretty much given it. Um, so when we're yeah when when we see the, the uh, pot to boil or the the chopping, um, we see how it is, but we're still um, let's see yeah let's see we're still filling in. I mean, in, in ways I wouldn't say it's, it's very different from, from like books and stuff like that um, because we're still filling in sounds and we're still filling in other things. Um, we're still filling in the, the details that we're not given. Um, let's see. I, I think I might have to think about it a little, bit, little more to, to fully answer the question, to fully answer your question. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, like we do it all the time visually. Actually, when we move our eyes, mm -hmm. we have the second and actually, like people are talking about them in similar ways. So we do a lot of filling with blank spots and imagine the motion that happened while we were moving our eyes. Uh, so I think that probably helps for comics and, and movies. A lot. And I noticed in the pictures you had of like actual images of boiling soup and yeah. chopping board and so mm -hmm. on, that one of the pictures was basically just a bowl with steam coming out of it, yeah. uh, which was 
much less like there was a lot more filling in to be done right yeah like you would first have to imagine a, a liquid and then yeah. a liquid that's bubbling because yeah. it's hot and so on mm -hmm. whereas another picture where you literally saw the bubbles on the surface bursting yeah um do that indicate that there's sort of a minimum amount of stimuli that you need to sort of convey something uh, like you can't fill in all of it otherwise you'd be able to read a blank page and still get not really sure, actually. Uh, I think I think. So you're you're asking if there's a minimal amount of information given to be able to fill out something or. or yeah, okay. like a lot of these comics are very vivid, a lot yeah. of actions, a lot of and so on. Yeah. Um, but if you take your argument into consideration, then most of it shouldn't be that necessary. Most of the filling in should be that necessary. No, most of the actual lining, like the ribble ah. and so on. Like. Wait, now, so now I'm a little bit confused. But I would say that if you would just have a bowl without steam, then you wouldn't be able to infer boiling, exactly. heatness, whatever. So I think there is some sort of minimal exactly. thing that needs but to then, be there. But then it surprises me that most comics are super complex and very vivid in lines and colors and so on. If you don't need more than yeah, a I think it's in order to help yet. you the most, because like you said, if you only have a bowl with steam, then you need to go through. I mean, not consciously, but yeah, but multiple processes yeah. to construct it. Yeah. yeah. Also, it's probably stronger if it comes from yeah. you in all different angles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that was an answer, but yeah. Yeah, yeah I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll think about it some more. So. We were talking about mental representation during the comics. Yeah. Motion. What happened if uh, some motion or some movement or even sounds are counterintuitive to the reader? What do you mean? C counter what? Con intuitive. Uh, ah. Counterintuitive. Yeah. Counterintuitive. And what happened with that mental representation? You know. Sorry, my English. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> I'm actually not sure. I mean, I'm not sure uh, if the reader would um, replace it with their own example or just go with uh, what the illustrator. I think it depends um, on if. Uh, yeah. I'm not Sure. Maybe start filling the blanks or yeah, yeah. misunderstand the, yeah. the notion of the picture or something. Yeah. I think uh, the reader might follow the, the indications, the actual uh, visual wounds. For example, if, if you have a representation of a coin falling, mm -hmm. but then behind you have a boom, yeah. you will follow the boom, you will not follow the plink that was supposed to be. Ah, okay. Yeah. So, so you'd say that um, it would be the. So, like. If it had a boom, you'd be like, okay, well, this this coin is supposed to be like super heavy or something like that. It's, it's like a, a you know a magic coin or something like that. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Fill the blanks. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for not really answering those questions. <laughs> Cool.